everybody to this session about predictive auto scaling patterns in Kubernetes. My name is Roberto Caratala, and with me is my colleague and friend Herman Montalvo Jimenez. I worked uh, as a cloud services black belt in Red Hat, and previously I worked as a specialist solutions architect, uh, always focusing in Kubernetes and in DevOps landscape. And I'm a very big fan of open source, and I'm a contributor and maintainer of a couple of projects. And I really like to uh, talk in this type of event, so I'm very glad to be on site today. And this is Herman Montalvo. I'm a technical marketing manager in SUSEM. I'm a specialized in business critical Linux. I'm an open source contributor in, in some projects I'm not maintaining and one. I'm also in charge of uh, doing some technical writings and uh, for product launches and, and some others. I'm usually uh, I'm a speaker internally on workshops and on customers and, and some good events. So you can find and reach me on, also on LinkedIn and on Poly if any one of you is using right now. So let's start discussing our initial problem. Imagine that you have your application and you want to deploy into your different Kubernetes clusters in production. And then suddenly you have a question. What's the right size for your different workloads? So determining this proper size of your different workloads in your clusters is challenging because are not static. These applications will evolve and not consume the exact same amount of CPU and memory that they've uh, won or after one year, for example. And even though if you have the right observability tools, like Prometheus, it would be still difficult to correctly estimate this application resource because this evolves, this application will change. And determining this best resource consumption of your different applications it's crucial in order to try to define the proper capacity planning of your different Kubernetes clusters. So, in terms of handling the resources in a Kubernetes cluster, when we have these two limits and requests, we can understand the limits and requests and the maximum of the minimum. The limits is where the, your pods, your application pods, is starting to crash loop back off, is going to be restarted. And the request is the minimum amount of resources your application will get when you deploy that application. This bot um, applies for CPU and the memory. We're going to focus all this uh, VPA. Um, in terms of these uh, two resources. So why should you care about the requests and the limits? First of all, we, had, we need to warranty a certain amount of quality of service, depending on where your application is deployed. So if, the, if both requests and limits are, um, are set, we can have our application in a warranted mode, in a quality of service or type of warranty. This ensures that you have um, the required amount of resources um, when you deploy your application. It's uh, managed by the, by the scheduler. We have a second one, which is boostable. With boostable happens when you set the request, but not the limits, because maybe you don't know if your application is ready to be deployed in production and um, you don't know how, how to set the limitation for that application because you don't know how the application is going to evolve. Is the application is not working the same way the first day than the first month. So it's going to be evolving, so you know that you have the, you know the limits, you know the request, but you don't know the limits. And then if you don't have any idea about how your application is going to behave when you start in accepting some clients on it, we have the best effort. The best effort stands for uh, we don't have any requests or the limits. The quality of service is something that you cannot set into the YAML. You, know, you cannot put it into the YAML definition. OK, you can put it, but it's going to be ignored. So. Um, in terms of understanding which application gets prioritized in terms of the scheduling to, to kill that application to make a space for, for other application, best effort gets killed first. Then if no more best effort pods, the burstable pods get um, killed. And uh, if you find a situation where you need to kill the pods on warranted, you will probably fail setting the, the size of your Kubernetes clusters. So let's move into it. You fail setting the resource limit. So now what? First of all, our application will well, well we'll get a we'll get a message of uh, about we reach and uh, um, or we surpass the threshold of the 
resources, so we get um, killed. This message is something that you get in your application logs or uh, describing the situation on the pods. This is uh, part of the laboratory we're going to do later on. And the pods will show you in a crash loop back off. So the pods will restart the application. The application will start consuming until the, uh, the limit threshold is reached, and then the application will restart it over and over again. We will have a poor workload performance. What that means? If we have no one deploys a Kubernetes cluster just for a single application, so we have several different applications that can be affected by the behavior you have on one application if you don't set it uh, into the right way. We are going to make the, schedule, the scheduler life uh, harder because we are not setting any resource, so we are not telling them how um, how many resources they need to, or, or the worker needs to, to, um, to have to hold my, my, my pods. Uh, finally, the SREs will not be happy at all because uh, no one likes to get a call in the middle of the night telling that the, the cluster is, is being shut down. So um, that, that stands also, we, we cannot create a good capacity plan for my clusters and, and to deploy my application if I have. Uh, I don't know, maybe 50 applications to deploy in my cluster. If I don't have a good capacity plan, uh, we won't be able to respect or to make the SLE or SLO um, to fulfill the, the, the request that we have. So what is the solution? The solution is going to be the vertical port autoscaler. The vertical port autoscaler frees the user from the necessity of setting up uh, up-to-date resource limits and requests for the container in their pods. Uh, if you are not using VPA, you need to be aware when your application is requesting more and more resources, no matter if CPU or memory, uh, the application will require more. So you need to decide in which situation you decide to put more resources for a specific application, and in which other situation that's not, the, that's not ideal. So Vertical Pod Autoscaler can do that for you. It will retrieve how the application is behaving from the Kubernetes metrics, and then it will set the request automatically based on what it gets from the metrics. It will also maintain ratios between limits and requests. Maybe you're wondering, how can I prevent my application or a single application get a thousand of, of megabytes of, of limits and a minimum amount of memory? Um, a VPI will maintain these ratios between certain limits. When we go to the demonstration, you are going to see how can you set the hard limits for, uh, for, for the resources and a, hard and a minimum uh, values accepted for, for the YAML. So when should we use uh, VPA? When should we start thinking about and using VPA? From the developer's perspective and from the administrator perspective. From the developers, you're going to use VPA to help ensure your pods stay up during periods of high demand. We all have some experience on customers where they have a specific uh, type of traffic they need to handle during the weekends. Um, we don't want to have a Kubernetes cluster up and running maybe during the whole week because this is a wasting of resources, resources that can be invested to other, uh, to other applications that could be uh, high priority during the, during the week. Um, so VPA, from the developer perspective, will allow you to add that flexibility to the application, to the applications you, you, you are creating. And from the administrator perspective, it's uh, quite an obvious. You will have uh, the capacity to have a better utilized cluster resources. When you are a, a Kubernetes administrator, you need to um, ensure certain times of availability in the depends of the application. You are going to separate or split in your application depending on the prioritization, and VPA will allow you to identify it and add some intelligence to the cluster, if you want to call it that. So let's uh, go to review the VPA architecture. So Sorry, VPA have three main components, the recommender, the updater, and the ammunition plugin. Recommender will monitor and will grab these Kubernetes metrics and will uh, produce a uh, uh, recommended values for your different containers, uh, CPU and memory as well. And then the updater will check if these managed pods have the correct amount of resources. And if not, will kill these pods and will recreate the controllers with the updated request as well. So 
also we have the emission plugin that sets these correct resource, uh, resource requests on the new pods, just on the new pods. Uh, either, for example, if they are newly created or recreated by the updater's activity. We have in here a diagram depicting, for example, the different components of the architecture. We have the VPA controller uh, with the recommender and updater watching also and managing the different uh, pods that uh, you can define and also grabbing some information about the metrics requesting through the API server to the metric server as well. And then with this information, we'll apply some recommendations using also admission controller as well. So, about the VPA modes, when you deploy or install a VPA, you will have um, an auto mode is, uh, is applied by default. The auto mode stands for the, uh, is, it, it will apply the recommended values uh, associated with the controller um, during the life cycle of your application. So if your application will be deployed a month or a year, the VPA will be adjusting the, the maximum of the minimum and the, the requests and the limits. This is the default mode when you see if you don't change that. You may be wondering, I want to get the recommendation at the beginning, but I don't want to follow the life cycle of my application because some planification that you could have. Then we have the initial mode. The initial mode automatically apply these recommended resources only when pods are associated with the workload and these, these, uh, these objects are created. So once it gets created, it will reach the metrics, the Kubernetes metrics, and it will use that metrics to set the recommended values for the objects when the, obje when the objects gets created. Or maybe you want to only get the recommendations, um, but you want to do that manually because you prefer to do that manually. Um, so you can disable that. You can put it to off. Off means that your application won't be affected by the VPA itself. You will only get the recommendation, but you are not only get um, any life, life changes in, in, in the application itself. About the installation and the documentation, first of all, vertical pod autoscaler is part of the Kubernetes. We are not extending anything. Well, we are extending anything if we consider that we are creating the CRTs. But this is not an external and a third party or things like that. This is part of the Kubernetes project itself. Um, it is an open, so it's an open source as the rest of the project, so you can get involved, you can uh, contribute to the project. It's uh, open and is uh, maintained by the by the community. Other container orchestrator, anyone related with uh, the vendor ones, um, use their own operators, deployments, CRDs, so check the docs if you want to deploy this in any vendor related uh, orchestrator. It's really important because not all vendors accept the same way to deploy uh, VPA. And finally, combining VPA and cluster autoscaler. This is just an, an extension of the um, of the use case, some of the use case that may affect to, to your customer or not. VPA recommendation might exceed available resources. So you will have most of the pods in pending state because your cluster is not big enough. As more pods you have in pending state, you can uh, trigger the cluster autoscaler. You can make the cluster autoscaler to, to grow up, adding new workers to the, to the platform, allowing you, your, your application, to be scaled up. That is really useful because the cluster autoscaler, the cluster autoscaler can scale up your cluster or can remove some of the nodes if you are not going to use that. So it will add more flexibility in terms of, um, in terms of knowing how many resources are you going to, um, are you going to invest to, to maintain this cluster, depending specifically on the workloads that you're going to need. It's a really cost efficiency, which is actually the two magic words that works with um, some customers. So VPA and cluster autoscaler could be a good combination for scale up and down cluster and a pod capacity based in utilization metrics. And finally, some of, re, some of the resources. Um, you can find the cluster autoscaler uh, documentation and everything the, from the project directly at the Kubernetes. Um, and for the demo we are going to, to move on right now, 
Uh, we have these two repository under my, my college organization. So it's Container Day 22 VPA and Container Day 22 VPA uh, demo.md. You can follow that instruction if you want to reproduce this uh, laboratory by your own. So let's jump into the demo. Okay, demo live. So let's see. The first thing that we want to check, okay, you can see probably, isn't it? Okay. And uh, then for avoiding to typos uh, and to not do anything, we can start a script that we can have two different scenarios. The first scenario, we will deploy an application and we will see what happens if we have not properly uh, settings uh, of the uh, resource uh, amount, like for example, request and limits. So we will generate a namespace. This namespace uh, will have not the uh, different uh, VBA, and we will deploy an application. This application is based in an image that is uh, called uh, Polynox Stress, and it's allocating memory and CPU. And then if you check, we have a limit of 200, and then we are setting and allocating more memory than the limits. So what happened? The application will crash. And if we list the resources, we can check that this effectively will have a state of crash loop back off. For what reason? Because we are allocating more memory than its limits. So this will crash, and if we check, the uh, reason, we can see that the reason is ohm killed. So our application is requesting more memory than uh, its limits is uh, allowing. So we have our application in a crash loop back off, and for example, uh, we have an issue. And we can see the exact same scenario using VPA. The first thing that we can see is the different VPA components installed in the cluster. So we will use and it's installed using uh, an operator, but you can also install it in the vanilla Kubernetes. And then we have the uh, admission plugin, the recommender, and the update as well. And we can use this using uh, and the, deploying a new namespace. This new, this new namespace will have uh, the exact same application. And uh, the first thing that we can uh, do is deploy the exact same application, but in this case, using 150 instead of 250, and it's a little bit below of the applications in order to start properly, and then we will adjust and uh, we will uh, put uh, more uh, resource allocation in order to mimic also the first scenario. So in this case, our application is up and running, everything is working properly, and if you, we can see and describe the request uh, and limits, we can see that effectively we have a limit of 200. And VPA will use these metrics and will grab these metrics of the Kubernetes metrics as well in order to adapt and provide some recommendations. But first, we, uh, they need to check the different metrics that the, uh, they have and they will produce. So VPA with this will grab the different uh, metrics and will produce a recommended values based in the different metrics that it's capturing. So in other ways, and now we uh, will capture this and we will um, use the uh, kubectl top nodes uh, and top pods as well in order to um, see what's uh, going on behind the hood. So, so in, in this case of the top pod as, uh, as well, if we check the uh, top pod in the namespace, we can see the effectively consumption in base of uh, the CPU and memory as well. And this uh, will use also by the VPA in order to grab this information and pro uh, provide a, um, recommended values for the CPU and memory. So in this case, we have almost one uh, CPU and also more or less um, the memory expected in megabytes as well. And we have here um, our pod that is running. And then we will provide a, a VPA. So VPA is namespace. So you can define and you can uh, de deploy your own VPA. And in, an important thing is this VPA will look for one specific deployment. So you are 
deploying a, VP, uh, a vertical pod of the scale uh, CR with this name, and also you have a target ref that is using this deployment of the stress. So this specific vertical pod of the scale CR will look for this deployment, and also we have the minimum uh, allowed and the maximum allowed. What's this? So the minimum allowed is the minimum um, resource um, consumption that uh, will be allowed, and also, and very important, to try to not conflict with other resources uh, and other applications in your cluster, we will have the maximum allowed. So this maximum allowed, we will adjust at the maximum one um, CPU and one gig of uh, RAM as well, and we will have two different control resources, the CPU and memory. Also, you can have your own, but in this demo, for um, simplicity, I'm using, and we are using CPU and memory. So, we generated the VPA uh, object. Actually, the good point of the main allower and a max allower is that you have the threshold of your application. You are not going to lose a control. This is the major concern we usually have when we are dealing with this kind of uh, features. So. Some guys, sometimes the customer is asking, hey, how can, how can we make sure that we are not controlling, that we are not losing the control about what we're deploying and how it affects the rest of the application? VPA allows you to set the minimum and the maximum, so you are going to work between these values. So you will keep the control even when you are, when you are letting the VPA to adjust the, the values for, for both requests and the limits. Yeah. And actually, it's defining the minimum and also the container name, as you can see. And uh, we are waiting, yeah, and the VPA capture asking the Kubernetes metrics in order to know, and if you check uh, the mode as uh, Seth Herman, it's effectively in mode auto, and you can see the target as well that we have with the actual memory consumption, and then our application that is limited to 200, we will increase suddenly, patching the deployment in order to try to um, also consume more. In this case, without VPA, the uh, application will crash, but with VPA, will adjust automatically and will check that effectively the VPA will provide automatically and will restart the pod, applying the specific um, resource um, that it's mm, requesting, predicting the proper application consumption, and then saving the day because our application is up and running in, all, uh, in every time. And for this reason, we can see before the limits and the request, suddenly we change it, and the VPA detects that, asking the Kubernetes metrics, wrapping this information, and then adjusting automatically the different limits and requests that we have, and then we can see the previous pod that is running and the new pod that will have effectively the um, different resource and limits that have. So we have in here the pod, for example, and if we check the namespace, we can have the namespace and effectively it's running a couple of um, seconds ago. So with that, we can head towards the Q&A. That was quick. We have some time left. We have some questions, definitely. Yeah. There's one that has a lot of votes. Why not APH, HPA that way around as a solution? That's a very good question. So HPA and VPA have also the different controllers. So HPA will add more ports and VPA also will try to adjust automatically the uh, requests and limits, um, uh, asking to the Kubernetes metrics. So in order to not conflict, it's not recommended to add VPA and um, HPA watching the exact same resource, because then will con cause conflicts. In fact, in the recommendation sets that it's not a very good practice in order to just grab this uh, and uh, control the exact same resource because it can cause uh, some mess. Also, maybe uh, HPA is going to allow you to create more than one replica of your application, and that may be not, not the way that you want your application to work, or maybe it is not accepted or not supported. So it is not like one thing or another. So it's like the VBA and the cluster autoscaler. It's something that is going to complement each other. 
Next question. Okay, how does the VPA update affect higher availability? So that's a very good question. So VPA app data will have also, because um, we'll ask uh, the CD and also we'll check the different uh, resources. Uh, you can add more replicas and uh, have also uh, in the controller, you can define uh, the number of replicas of their own components and then you can scale as well. So you can have this higher availability as well. So next question is, do we, need any changes on the application uh, to make use of uh, any uh, um, additional allocated memory that is deferred based on the, okay. Um, that's a very good question because sometimes Java um, will mess a little bit with the memory as well. In um, the first place, you don't need to have any uh, change to the application, but also sometimes you need to tweak something, uh, even uh, if it's, for example, with Java. So um, it's not black magic, it's just uh, try to predict in using the uh, metrics, but sometimes it's using also um, the recommended um, practices. So. Okay, so we have some more questions. It's very, very flexible, so people vote. Actually, yes. I mean, I think, that, I think everything it's really, changes. <laughs> I think yeah. it's really interesting. I mean, can the resource request be adjusted without uh, without restarting the pods by the updater? The point is, all the resources, the quality of service, and everything is related to a controller. So it is part of the Kubernetes that you cannot change the live object without recreating the object itself. So when you are going to change that, um, that request or the limits or, or whatever, whatever is the VPA is changing, the objects managed by that controller will be restarted, not because VPA, but it's because part of the nature of the, of the Kubernetes itself. Okay, so we have that question with the spikes. How does VPA handle spikes? What was? Um, uh, ah. the first question. Um, how do we, That's uh, a very good question. In order uh, to predict the spikes, we uh, demonstrated as well, because with the spikes, you can, um, um, and the VPA will ask the different uh, Kubernetes metrics, and if suddenly have a spike, will adjust automatically, because we'll ask the different Kubernetes metrics, we'll grab this information and we'll update it. So it's. Uh, if the spike is not um, very, very high, uh, this will be managed if the, for example, cluster have enough resources. If the, if the question is related with, do my application be able to handle that kind of spikes uh, just happen in a second? The answer is no, your application will crash because uh, that's something that you need to recreate the application itself. So you need to give some time to the application to readjust the, how many resources you have. You need to make sure that you have enough replicas to handle that. But if the consumption change from 200, gigabytes, 200 megabytes of memory to two terabytes of, of memory, the short answer is no, your application will, will crash and then it will readapt as long as the metrics will inform that you need more resources, if that into the accepted values of the VPA. Can you use a VPA in off mode together with an HPA? That's a very good question. Uh, and honestly, I need to check because uh, <laughs> we, we don't know. I think but we have a very, very good, good crowd. For the next one, yeah, absolutely. Okay, could the VPA scale the pod requests out of the nodes capacity, which will lead to padding pods? That's a very good question. And you can use combining um, the uh, VPA plus the cluster autoscaler in order to uh, not have these pending pods and uh, if you are growing, growing, and also adjusting the cluster autoscaler, then if you need more nodes, the cluster autoscaler will grow up, adding more nodes, and then VPA can, for example, restart the uh, pods in order to add more uh, memory and CPU. About the, uh, about the is a lower limit recommended? The recommendation is try to keep your application under control. If you already know that your application is not going to use more than 500 megabytes of memory, then you should, or VPA should use your memory to use up to that quantity of memory. Why is that? Because if you know the limits, you will have your application into a warranty or quality of service. And this is something that allows us to sleep when you have an, deploy, an application deployed on production. So the recommendation is trying to keep your application under control, and that's stands for using the lowest uh, limit as possible. Okay, next question. How does the scheduler fit into the mix of VPN cluster autoscaler? The, the one? 
the uh, ah, the I think it's the second question for now because right. it just jumped. Someone voted yes, for something actually. else. <laughs> we will come to that. Yeah, I don't really like that system. If you are using the DS scheduler, you will probably need to drop any of uh, and any of the other solution because the DS scheduler actually um, actually works in some kind of an opposite side of the VBA. So if you are working the three of them, you should be um, well. It depends actually of the most of the use cases, but. Um, you should be using the three of them at the same time. OK. Things are moving. Can we pay use Prometheus metrics as scaling criteria? Yeah, you can, in fact, use. We um, demonstrate that uh, by default, you have the Kubernetes metrics of CPU and memory, but also you can um, add Prometheus uh, at the creation and then can wrap this information towards Prometheus as well. There are a couple of plugins that are developed by the community, and you can um, grab uh, as well um, information scraping from Prometheus. About of the question of uh, if I have more pods in the same deployment, will VPA recreate all the pods at the same time? The answer is depending on what you define in your controller. If you are setting, for example, a PDB, a pod disruption budget, if uh, anyone is using that, um, it will be VPA will respect that because VPA is not killing your pods. VPA is instructing or changing the behavior of the controller. So the controller will be in charge of telling, I need to recreate all the objects. So. Um, it depends actually what you write into the controller, how you want your applications to be redeployed. Okay, we have only three questions left. I can think we can go through them. What happens if the admission controller goes offline? How can I ensure that I can still be able to schedule and start new pods in this scenario? So in that case, you need to maintain the admission console up and running because we'll be handling this type of situation. So um, with the high availability of the um, also admission controller that you can add more replicas, then you can ensure at least that uh, you have um, the new pods uh, adjusted with the new uh, resource and um, limits defined. For the quota calculations, um, is the pod resources the source of the VPI values if they are in place? Actually, yes. The quota calculations is not made based on the amount of resources you set in the request on the limits. The quota calculations is based if you set a value or not in both requests and limits or only on the request or only on the limits. Actually, if you want to have a boostable, for example, a boostable means that you have to set the request but not the limits. But if you set only the limits, the bots automatically becomes in a warrant tier because that implies that you already said the, the request because you didn't set the request that there is no gap between whatever that is in request and whatever you have in limits. So uh, the Kubernetes is going to assume that you, have, uh, that, that you have the same quantity. So it's going to behave like that. The source is if, if you have defined it or not. There was a new question coming in and easily got five votes. Does VPA collide with Helm? Very good question. So you can define with Helm whatever you want, but you need to take care also that VPA will adjust automatically the different request uh, limits. And then if you are applying as well Helm, we will rewrite the uh, different uh, request and limits, but just uh, in the deployment. So yeah, we'll collide it in that, uh, in that case. So um, you need to take care uh, uh, defining the different request and limits. And for the last one, um, for the last one I am expecting, that's why it's so important that you check the documentation because maybe you are on the stage and you don't know how to answer that question. The point is, depending on the documentation, we don't know actually from what uh, version it's, uh, is going to be available, but I'm sure that you can go there and check the docs and see in which version you will see that available. Anyone else? No. And we care.